Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burrus. Joining us today is Cass Sunstein. He's the Robert Wellmsley University professor at Harvard, where he's founder and director of the Program on Behavioral Economics and Public Policy. He has served as administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs and is a member of the President's Review Group on Intelligence and Communications Technologies. He's the author of many books and his newest is The World According to Star Wars. Welcome to Free Thoughts. A pleasure to be here. So in light of your academic and scholarly career and the, the books you've written, this one stands out a bit. So I guess why Star Wars? Well, uh, it's not as if I thought that writing a book on Star Wars was a logical progression of my work <laughs> on constitutional law and regulation. It wasn't like culminating in this. Uh, I have a now seven-year-old son who got obsessed at the age of five with Star Wars, a healthy obsession, I should say, that lasted only a few months. Um, but during that period, I got keenly interested in two questions. First, how did George Lucas come up with this? And second, why did this become such a defining saga for our culture? And the first question actually got to me more than the second initially uh, about how creativity works. And I found what isn't uh, a mystery if you dig a little bit that a lot of the plot points of Star Wars were uh, seat of the pants uh, improvisations uh, by a guy who was constructing a series of narratives. And it occurred to me that's a lot like a lot of things, including political life, uh, for better or for worse, constitutional law has that feature. Uh, our own lives have that feature. Uh, freedom itself pulls in that direction of episode creation. And that uh, got to me and I thought that's, that's an interesting tale to tell. And then the question, how did this thing end up taking over our culture? Now, your own personal uh, experience with Star Wars, uh, did, did you – do you remember seeing the first movie or or when it really hit you that this was the coolest thing I, ever? I remember it as if it was five minutes ago. I, I, I confess I was mostly a Star Trek fan uh, until relatively recently but I like Star Wars plenty. And seeing that uh, that original ship in uh, what's now called A New Hope uh, and it getting – bigger and bigger on the screen and continuing and continuing. I must have seen it within a couple months of initial release. And it was like a joke to see that ship just keep going. And all of the mysteries of who was Obi-Wan really, who was the father, uh, what is the force, uh, how did this, these visuals come come into one's face. So that uh, that's uh, a keen memory. And for everyone who saw the initial release of A New Hope, I think it's, it's seared on the brain. One of the interesting parts of the book um, – there's many interesting parts of the book, but we'll go – we'll step through them in the order they're presented, I suppose. Um, from the perspective of the kinds of things that Trevor and I have talked about a lot on this podcast in the past is – the way that markets work and the way that markets find things to be successful or reward merit or how things take off because there's there's this kind of crude story that markets simply – if it's good, it will sell and if it doesn't sell, then that's an indicator that it was bad or it was a shoddy product. But you have an extended discussion of how it's more complicated than that by way of trying to explain whether Star Wars was inevitable. Well, there's also a, even an, another side of a crude market analysis, sort of Galbraithian, that uh, advertisements and corporations can make you want things that you don't actually want. So somewhere in the between those, when you analyze why Star Wars is popular to begin with. Right. These are great questions. So uh, Star Wars success is a challenge for Galbraith in the sense that it seemed to be a spontaneous bubbling up of enthusiasm. The studio didn't advertise it much. They just had two ads and in holiday seasons and the studio didn't expect it to do very well and so didn't uh, didn't create Star Wars tastes. I think if you'd asked them before the movie was released, you know, create a Star Wars taste so that your movie will be a success, they would have thought that's crazy and it, it's doomed. So in a way, the success of the tale is a tribute to the uh, bottom-up processes that often markets uh, reflect. Uh, on the intrinsic merit point versus the 
uh, the kind of social network point, uh, it's it's very hard to tell because history is only run once. So let's uh, give both examples. The intrinsic merit argument is that at least some goods take off in markets because they're just too phenomenal. And uh, you know you can take your favorite picks. It might be. Uh, Apple computers or the iPhone or it might be uh, some General Electric plot products at certain points in time which just took over. They just work so well. And you could say Star Wars is the equivalent of that. And while it was not anticipated, uh, Steven Spielberg, who's pretty smart, said after he saw the first one, "This George, this is the best movie ever made. And uh, the audiences, you know, we've talked about that a little bit, they went berserk. The studio couldn't foresee that, just like governments often can't foresee stuff. So uh, a point for Hayek maybe. <laughs> uh, the things are great and that it's hard to know until people get going. Uh, that might be – and I think the book does say in the end that is the right account. Star Wars was too, too amazing not to do really well. Easy to say that in hindsight though. So the alternative view, which I think often is correct, whether it's correct in the context of Star Wars, I'm just not sure, is that once you pass a certain threshold of awesomeness, you can either tank or be a spectacular success depending on the social dynamics that markets reflect. So um, Profiles in Courage by John F. Kennedy is a famous book. It did spectacularly well. Uh, if his dad hadn't bought 40,000 copies and put them in Hyannis in some sort of place, who knows whether it would have done well. It became a bestseller and then was kind of a famous book and kept going. Now, the idea for Star Wars would be that as for many products that markets uh, reward, it got the benefit of early enthusiasm that created a kind of echo chamber. And as the echo chamber got louder, more people heard it. And once they heard it, they started joining it. Now, if it had been terrible, it would have tanked. But it needed the echo chamber and the kind of uh, cascade effect that echo chambers often create. Without that, you know, maybe we'd be talking about uh, uh, some other movie uh, or the TV show Awake, which was from 2011, I think. Fantastic. It never created an echo chamber or if it did, I was the only one in it. <laughs> and uh, uh, since I didn't come out as a fan of Awake until this very moment, it's kind of buried in the book, uh, there, it was as if no one liked th that phenomenal TV show. So I think markets, sometimes amazingness is sufficient. But often amazingness is necessary but not sufficient and you need the – uh, the, the the network maybe the best demonstration that it, anything Star Wars wouldn't have produced a cascade effect is the Star Wars holiday special, which did not become very big or very popular despite writing the cascade of Star Wars thing because it is just horrible, absolutely horrendous. How widespread was the Star Wars phenomenon when it hit? Because there's, it seems like we sometimes, especially now can misread how culturally, culturally pervasive things are. So I'm thinking of there was a recent article um, in Current Affairs on the musical Hamilton that, that basically pointed out that if, you, if you're someone who reads the New York Times and the New Yorker and other bastions of, kind of cultural good taste, you get the sense that Hamilton is the biggest thing in the world right now. But Almost nobody has seen it and as they point out, basically everyone who's seen it are the people who are writing about it. And, and then similarly, we get these stories every now and then about how you think like these other TV shows, Breaking Bad is, is the biggest thing in the world but its ratings are actually very small. It's just a certain class of people talking about it whereas I think like the biggest TV show is that NCIS because it's watched by like retired people in flyover country basically. Um, and so Star Wars, did it look like that? Could it have been bigger? Um, was it focused in areas? OK. So it's a, a great question uh, that um, Star Wars, we could think early – in early days, that is the days of A New Hope, was spectacularly successful in the sense that there were all these uh, crowds around the block but that it was very narrow compared to something that was you know genuinely every everybody heard of or 85% of people knew about it 
I think Star Wars was not relatively narrow, though it took a few months to get there. So it was originally released on just dozens of screens. It couldn't get in the movie theaters. Amazing, right? That uh, that n these people whose economic self-interest was at stake made such a mistake in uh, not seeing this would take off. I have I have some explanation for why that might be so, but let's bracket that. Uh, after the the big crowd started coming around, and you know they were going around the block, you don't see that. Uh, anymore. It started getting on the evening news. So Walter Cronkite, who was watched by not a small segment of people, but by lots and lots of Americans. I don't have the number, but much higher than evening news now. Or Bill O'Reilly, yes. <laughs> or Bill O'Reilly. He was even more popular than Bill O'Reilly. Uh, hard as it is to imagine. <laughs> uh, he, he had a segment on Star Wars. And the the general interest news magazines like Time and Newsweek, they covered Star Wars. And they had much more salience then. So the, the kind of number that gives you a clue is that Star Wars became the second most, uh, in inflation-adjusted terms, the second most successful movie of all time after Gone with the Wind. And that happened in relatively short order. And Gone with the Wind was probably in theaters for ye a year or two back in the day, yeah. back when there was no VHS or TV. It was Completely. probably in theaters forever. Completely. So if you adjust not only for inflation but for entertainment – uh, options. Uh, Star Wars undoubtedly the all-time winner. So uh, uh, we have to break it down demographically. There must be some demographic groups that would have had no idea what Star Wars was. But compared to almost anything in the last, what, 75 years, uh, Star Wars had, had pervasiveness, not like Mad Men which the example like Breaking Bad where the elites love it. They thought everyone's talking about Mad Men and the percentage of people who are talking about Mad Men, very small. Yeah. So the 20th Century Fox executives who didn't realize what uh, what this was going to be. So we have a theory of why this might be the case. Now, it seems to me that we could also talk about the way businesses try to find opportunities as we mentioned at the beginning. But 20th Century Fox was a big studio and this was a really weird movie. So. Maybe they were just risk averse because large businesses tend to be risk averse to something that's pretty different from – I don't know what the biggest movie in 1976 was but it probably wasn't anything like Star Wars. It probably <laughs> had Burt Reynolds. It probably had Burt Reynolds. Yeah, Smoking the Bandit I think came out at the same time, Burt Reynolds yeah. or – yeah. So they were risk – I mean this was pretty weird. The, the only closest analog would have been like a Flash Gordon kind of cheesy B-movie thing. So is there – so that we can learn about the risk averseness of large companies with a lot on the line. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's great and I think that's correct. So uh, big companies often think – What's successful is what's like things they have had success with and what's doomed is like things that have uh, failed in the past or that they've never had success with. And as you talk, I actually – it occurred to me, which it didn't occur to me when writing the book, that there's a behavioral science explanation which is the availability heuristic mm -hmm. where you think something is – more probable if an, an example comes to mind. So if you have an example of a Burt Reynolds movie and there are plenty at the time, you think this is like that, this will do well. There's just no example of a movie like Star Wars, Flash Gordon with very limited serial. So it's not irrational to use the availability heuristic if you have uh, limited information and to see a movie that's like nothing anyone had seen before and think this is going to do spectacularly well. That would take a lot of uh, boldness and independence of standard market outcomes. I was also told something though after the book was published that was, I found very informative, which is someone in an audience that I spoke to about exactly this topic went to USC film school and said that he'd seen the rough cut of Star Wars that the studio thought was bad. And he said they weren't dumb. It was bad. 
And I said, well, what made it bad? And he said, there were three things. First, some of the key voices were done by actors for whom Lucas found substitutes, most notably Darth Vader. And if you hear some guy with a, you know, some sort of weak voice talking Darth Vader. Cockney, you're talking of a cockney David Prowse. Yeah. Like, was that a British guy? I think. Yeah, cockney, British, British guy. Accent. Yeah. And it just doesn't cut it as Darth Vader. Instead of menacing, he seems kind of like, like a your favorite. Like Ritchie film yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah your favorite <laughs> uncle or something. And a nice guy who's trying to be tough. And so that was the first thing. The second thing is they didn't have the sound effects. And if you don't have the sound effects, the movie is much weaker. And the third thing he said, it didn't have John Williams. And that music is critical. Now, as he talked, I thought, you know, still, the music is great, but you don't need the music and the sound effects. His view was you need the music and the sound effects. So that, that probably added to the sense of doomed. Now, if they'd seen the original thing, would they have thought awesome? I think for your reason, not. They would have thought you know, uh, skilled and amazing, but the moviegoers aren't going aren't gonna to like it. Yeah, the music was the thing that I noticed was conspicuously absent in your, your discussion of a success because I, I've always wondered how much of Star Wars' success was John Williams. I mean, you've got here arguably the greatest score, movie score of all time. And George Lucas said it was the only part of the movie that he was completely satisfied with. Yeah, and, you know, so if... If we had had kind of a bad 70s electronic soundtrack <laughs> or something, I mean, one of those Italian see, like, like synth bands, yeah, like zombie, yeah. <laughs> it's a great point. So, uh, uh, if I were doing the book all over again, I would put more emphasis on John Williams. The, the character and the creativity of George Lucas is, I think, uh, completely fascinating. And his combination of attraction to Flash Gordon and really shallow stuff and his uh, deep reading and I think deep soul, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, irresistible. Uh, so, so that tale uh, kind of took over my own narrative. Uh, but John Williams, you're right. W without him, who knows? What about reading the popularity of Star Wars in the other direction and what it says about how things succeed in markets because we've been talking about – so it's got – you need a certain degree of merit um, because if it's terrible, then network effects probably aren't going to make it successful anyway. But once you get over that, then there's all this – what often amounts to luck um, for it to become successful. But is it also possible that the quality of – that we're overjudging the quality of these films because it's so – successful. So once a whole bunch of people started liking it, then you had to like it or there was something wrong with you, which is how I currently – people who say they don't like Star Wars, I think there's something wrong with them. <laughs> um, and so there's like cultural pressures to like it and then overassess its quality. I think you're completely right. So uh, the, the, I think the clearest example is, is the Mona Lisa, which is the most famous painting in the world. It became famous because it was stolen and became a cause celebre. In its time, it was thought to be you know, one of da Vinci's good paintings, but not the best. And people see it, like ordinary people, as well as people who know something about art, unlike yours truly, and they see it and they think, oh my God, the mystery of her smile, the subtlety of her expression. And this, this, it's probably, it's a very good painting, but it's not that all that special. I've never met anyone who went to the Louvre who wasn't disappointed by it. I'm, I'm it's new. also small. It's very small. It's always crowded. Yeah. And it's the most famous painting. So Star Wars, you know, I have uh, – uh, after working on it for so long, I have a sense that anything a human being could give as a rating to Star Wars is too low, <laughs> that it's kind of infinitely good. Uh, but that might be uh, immersion, <laughs> which is a, a, a even stronger version of what you're describing. So the idea that it is – you know, not just uh, tremendous and uh, uh, magnetic, but the first three are the greatest movies ever. I will stand by that view, but acknowledge that there you have to drink a lot of Kool-Aid to think something like that. <laughs> so, so this is a. Uh, I mean, 
Aaron and me times would just want to run a Star Wars podcast, I think, which I would be okay with. But this is ostensibly a political uh, uh, show to some extent. So, but there are there is political elements of of Star Wars, and uh, and you talk about it a little bit in the book. You actually and you even quote because I wrote a piece a while back uh, when the new movie came out about maybe what was wrong with the galactic governing structure, and um, you quote the opening crawl from Attack of the Clones, which you 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 think is better than Phantom Menace. Yeah, in I think so. Ranking. The movie, yeah, yeah. No, no, you, you, Aaron's shaking his head. He thinks, but but the the opening crawl of Attack of the Clones gives you this interesting little thing. It says, "There is unrest in the Galactic Senate. Several thousand solar systems have declared their intentions to leave the Republic," which is interesting because apparently there are several thousand solar systems represented in. The Galactic Republic, which seems a little unwieldy. If we go back to American history and we talk about the discussions of whether or not we could govern a republic with thirteen disparate colonies, several thousand solar systems seems maybe like this is maybe this is why the empire came along. Uh, your thoughts? That's on that? a great point. So you know, in the American founding, there was a debate between the heirs of Montesquieu, who thought that a centralized republic was doomed, especially if you had. Uh, diversity. You just couldn't govern. And uh, the Anti-Federalists actually spoke accurately for Montesquieu in saying this is a big mistake. And Madison and Hamilton had all thought that size could be a virtue because you could have uh, uh, more checks and also more virtue, literal virtue. Uh, the, the representatives would be better in, in character. Uh, so size would counteract faction. Uh, Madison and Hamilton won the, that debate in their time, but I don't think they would think that, you know, thousands and thousands of solar systems, you're going to have a large republic and, and it's going to turn out okay. So for something like that to work, it's kind of an impossible thought experiment, but there'd have to be a, an accompanying technology that allowed people to deliberate in a representative way without uh, missing a ton of information. And you know, there's a lot of technology in Star Wars. But well, that, that's why I thought it was an interesting <laughs> question because your, your, your work on politics deals with technology and good governance and things like this and I'm just sitting here trying – like could, could Cass figure out how to make this work? I mean I'd put you in charge of the OIRA of the Galactic Empire. It'd be fine. Cost benefit if, analysis. If, exactly. Yeah, if we can make this work, I just I just think it might – because I see an analogy too because it also in Attack of the Clones, they talk about how the Republic is ground to a halt. It, it's no longer getting work done and the emperor comes in to say, I'm going to get things done, which maybe also has some parallels to now. Oh, this is great. So Montesquieu you said the system of separation of powers had a natural state of repose or inaction, which is uh, you know, paralysis in its extreme case. And on one view, that's that's fine that you uh, you know uh, burden a government with so many uh, obstacles that you free up liberty. That's that's one view. But another view, which I think accounts for the emperor's success, is if you have a paralyzed government, then then it can't do stuff that's indispensable. Now, let's suppose the view is that there are police and uh, national defense functions that are necessary and the government can't agree on that because it's paralyzed. Then even if you think the central in the galact in the old old republic has uh, a quite libertarian set of responsibilities, maybe it can't do them because they're all – they can produce a budget. We're not sure exactly what they're fighting over but if they can't do police and fire protection, then problems. This is made interesting in light of what we know in – the Force Awakens too because we've had – we've had Palpatine rise to power and then we've had him overthrown and Return of the Jedi ends with this triumphant like the galaxy is going to be great now and then not so much 30 years later um, and it's, it's the same problems again. You've got a republic government that can't get anything done and this is explored a bit more in a few of the novels that have come out which are – as canon as the movies are now, um, but and you've got this external threat that's that like the the government can't figure out how to deal with, and so Leia has no choice but to just head off on her own and create freedom fighters again. That it seems like they just can't learn from their mistakes, and that maybe this is. I mean, one of the interesting things in one of the books is in um, in Bloodline, 
is they talk about there's thousands of planets and they're fighting with each other and the split seems to be between basically free traders and protectionists um, and they can't figure it out and everyone's got an opinion but then whenever they debate, there's like six people debating um, because they can't figure out how to get the thousands debating at once. Um, <laughs> and so it seems like it, it's an eternal seems, debate. I mean, it ultimately seems ambiguous. Like it's because bureaucracy, the freedom that then creates like everyone should have a voice, democracy doesn't seem to work. But they're clearly – I mean some people think it's pro Palpatine but it's probably not either. Is there – so out of this, is there kind of a, a system that seems to be like what Star Wars slash George Lucas wants or is it just kind of a throwing up your arms and saying stuff's ungovernable? That's a great question. So I think Lucas and now Abrams and his colleagues, they're extremely alert to the risks of an authoritarian system. So they're clear in their heads about that. But more interestingly, they're clear in their heads about the risks of a self-governing system where the risks are they can't reach decisions, they bicker all the time and maybe they just don't know what they're doing. So the, the latter seems to me more uh, surprisingly interesting than the first two, though all of them are relevant today. So the idea that you have uh, people fighting over free trade who really don't uh, have a handle on how to think about that, that that's interesting. And uh, one thing that doesn't have kind of a halo around it in the Star Wars world is a technocratic conception of government. In fact, it doesn't even appear. And I think Lucas's rebel heart would be very suspicious of that. Um, but it, it is a view and you could think of like first order technocrats who would be trying to figure out free trade just by crunching a lot of numbers. They'd be like the Council of Economic Advisors and they might bicker but they'd be bickering on the numbers and that's a much narrow kind of bickering than what you're describing. Or you could have second order technocrats who could say that there are areas which will fence off from the republic's hands because they'll screw it up and we'll have decentralization uh, to either local authorities or to markets. And it's interesting, neither first order nor second order technocratic stuff appears in the Star Wars movies or so far as I can recall in the in the books. It, it wouldn't make a great movie. It would be very challenging <laughs> even for uh, tremendous directors to give that human uh, resonance. Um, well, there is the the trade federation in the beginning of Phantom Menace, which I, which is yes, that's true. They seem to be somewhat. I, I'm not a quasi governmental entity, but we, the whole thing begins with a trade dispute. And now I'm just thinking of Darth Trump and like him sending in you know his trade negotiate. This is how he's going to get a better deal by sending his trade negotiators to China, blockade China, like to blockade China, make some you know that's you know, kill the Jedi on the way. You know, it's it, a lot of things can begin as trade disputes, which is kind Completely. of interesting. Yeah. It, don't, aren't the prequels and the terms we're discussing? They are emerging as much more interesting than they than have more the, politics in them. Yeah. And the politics, you're, you're, you're putting your finger on the fact that the fact that it starts with a trade dispute, that's pretty clever. I mean it, it's not a movie that people greatly admire but that's uh, – that resonates and, and it resonates in 2016 much more clearly than it did in the 90s when it was released. Something very, very agile about that and with some of the things that Albert Hirschman talked about, about how uh, uh, powerful authoritarian governments uh, exp expand their reach, it has a lot to do with trade. One of the things that struck me as I was writing up questions for our conversation now is this how looking at the current election in light of Star Wars and it's I mean it's always a stretch when you're doing things like that but but one of the things it seems is that Palpatine was way too subtle I mean if, if anything like the Trump candidacy is like just come out and tell people yeah. you're a <laughs> Sith and that you know and and, and you're going to make everything better. go for it like why hide it that seems a more effective strategy. Yeah. Great. Well, it's uh it's risky to draw general lessons from an N of 1. <laughs> but I, I take your point. So, uh 
what is Trump saying? He's saying a lot of things. So one thing he's saying is that in part because of trade deals, uh, American workers and companies have been harmed greatly. Now that's not uh, subtle. It's not something that uh, Palpatine himself said. It's not something that is self-evidently evil or even wrong. I, you know, you won't be surprised here. I'm not a. I don't expect to vote for Mr. Trump, but he's he's connecting with something that both fits with people's experience. They think, and also there's some data suggesting the idea that. For some American workers of a non-trivial number, trade deals have been uh, – have had an adverse effect on, on, on their jobs. So there's, there's something there. Now, the, the, the Palpatine thing has many different bits. You're right. It's very uh, uh, duplicitous and subtle and uh, his ultimate appeal – and this fits with some things in Nazi Germany, is he's going to exercise authority. And, and, there, and th that he accepted with apparent reluctance in the movies, though of course he relished it. That was what he was after. And this isn't the Trump phenomenon at all. But what is the Trump phenomenon is the idea that you'll have someone who can actually do stuff uh, and also someone who is going to uh, – uh, create barriers, whether they're physical walls or they're trade things, that will prevent the hollowing out, so to speak, of the nation. And that's a more particular thing than, than we observe in Star Wars. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking now whether the rise of uh, powerful leaders, either of a you know, okay sort or an objectionable sort, frequently has that feature, and I'm not seeing it. So that suggests the, the Trump thing really is in its substance uh, responds to a very particular historical thing. But I'll say something else about Trump connected with our earlier discussion. That there, there, you could think of Trump as kind of an inevitable product of our culture now. Or you could think of Trump as like a song that ends up taking off and it's because of a lot of factors which if a butterfly had flapped his wings at a different – Point that wouldn't that song wouldn't have taken off, and you know keep in mind that Trump, of course, he's resonating, but he, he may be a little like let's say a less good movie than Star Wars, meaning something that has some merit in terms of likely popularity, but which needed a lot of stuff to become the most successful movie of the year. And you know, he was competing with a whole lot of people, he was the only one who had instant uh, name recognition. Uh, because he was famous, he got a lot of publicity uh, in the early stages at least of a primary. Uh, any publicity is good publicity. Uh, the people dropped out basically in just the order that was useful for them to drop out. And then the idea would be that he's not connecting, you know, fantastically with some big strain in American culture. He's like uh, the biggest hit of 2013. I, I don't know what that was, <laughs> but uh, it may not be a timeless classic. Let me put it that but way. Exactly. <laughs> it well, could but, be Sugar, Sugar by the yeah, Archies, and yeah. that you know, not, not a timeless classic. Well, that, it's interesting because that's the. Uh, it's related – going back to – at the beginning, we were talking about how – why this was big, cascade effects and things like that, which you do compare to political campaigns in the book. But it is uh, – it could be related to uh, Israel Kirzner's concept of entrepreneurship and political entrepreneurship. Or is an entrepreneur finding a market that exists or is he creating a market that didn't exist? And political entrepreneurship would be – we have one view where it said Trump – there was a huge market out there and people – and he found it. Or maybe he created it in some way. Right. The creating market is extremely interesting. I'd like to think think more about that. So uh, one idea is that there's a pre-existing thing. You know, people are very upset about immigration or about uh, crime, and the person t t attacks that. Uh, another idea is the second idea is that there's a. Uh, no publicly articulated concern about the thing, but it's gnawing at people. And uh, the publicly articulated concerns would be 
you know, we're very worried about unemployment or we're very worried about uh, job that, loss, you to, know, middle to, class, yeah. Uh, like but but what's gnawing at people that they don't articulate because they think it's politically incorrect or that their view isn't shared is immigrants or uh, something about uh, national pride being diminished. And then when someone t talks about that, it's not creating uh, a, something that didn't exist before. It's just allowing people to give voice to something that they themselves had suppressed. And then there's a third thing, which is what you're pointing to, which is creating something that wasn't there before. That's extremely interesting in connection with current politics. So the immigration issue, it's unclear whether that is the second or the, the third, meaning something that people actually were concerned about but they weren't voicing. I think it's it's plausible to say that th this is something that's actually been created because in most people's experience of their lives, even I, I'm confident most Trump supporters, immigration from Mexico, et cetera, that isn't a problem for them. Yeah, they don't walk down the street and have it, see it all the time and – yeah. Yeah, and if they're having struggles in the workplace, meaning getting a job or getting good wages, it's not visibly and probably not in fact connected with uh, the absence of a wall. It might be connected with trade deals, but uh, but spec in any individual case, certainly very speculative. I turn to rebellions. Um, one of the points that you discuss at length in the book is this the the rebel line seems unexpected. Like the empire, you know, why didn't they see this coming and why didn't they react to it stronger when they had the chance? And so you go through the the question of how I mean at the beginning we've got Luke is basically grumbling about, I mean, I don't he doesn't like the empire. Um, but he's not going to do anything about it. He's got, you know, he's got the academy to get to and he's got farming to do and well, what the academy and, would be to join the empire too, right? Yes. But but I mean he's just got he's got things he's got a life like and he's got a um, he you know they, when what can he's one person what can he do and so that that tipping point of how you shift from I'm one person to I've got to do something and and then from I've got to do something to we've got to do something and where that comes from can you go into yes it's fantastic and it connects with Arab Spring I think it connects with the rise of political movements in the United States. It may have something to do with the apparently uh, uh, rising success of libertarianism in the United States these days. Uh, and th there are a few things when the movie I think is fantastic on this. One is if you have some external shock to your life uh, that just looks you know, somewhere between bad and intolerable. That can activate you politically. Now, Luke loses his aunt and uncle. It can be less dramatic than that and you think, I'm going to go for it. It's just, it's just unacceptable. Or without an external shock, it can be that in your set of associates, there's a mounting sense that you've got to do something. So uh, there are some people who think with respect to rebellion, uh, I'm, I'm just in for that and Leia is one. Then there are others who seeing Leia will, will go. Uh, there are others uh, who need to see Leia and the people who see Leia and, and the people who see people who see Leia. Those all have to go before they go. But then once there are so many people in, then the – it can be maybe the quiet 30 percent or so who are trying to live their lives but who don't want to be um, what creeps or left out or in a way uh, collaborators with the regime e even through inaction. Probably that was the American Revolution that a lot of people ended up joining because they didn't want to be collaborators with the regime. It's not like, like they left an aunt and uncle and not to join the American Revolution was a form of collaboration. So what's I think great about this in the sense of uh, instructive is that I at least before thinking about this in connection with Star Wars and other things thought that rebellions and big social movements involved uh, independent judgments by people who are just really fed up. But it's more like a wave than a uh, – 
than, than a bursting of independent judgments, like a wave in a stadium where people are joining others. But it, it's more complicated than the wave because it depends on the volume of the wave, which grows as people continue to join it. So you, and that there is the interpretation which you talk about a little bit, the jihadi Luke interpretation, which which is relevant in the sense that he was he was radicalized by the act of a large central government, the blowback of him killing them, killing his family, and uh, he joins a small group of scrappy rebels and takes down a huge thing. Uh, Completely, and you know the the idea that. Um, uh, that Luke is involved in some sort of religious mission, which is entangled with the rebellion. That's that's actually true. Now he's in favor of peace and justice, and he's against an empire. But you know George Lucas. Uh, it hurts me to say this because I'm just a fan of his. But he thought in A New Hope that the empire was kind of like the United States, and the rebellion was like the Viet Cong. I say this. Uh, you know, it makes me suffer to say this because I feel the United States is. The, the Republic and the empires, the, so the Soviet Union or authoritarian system. But he thought that, which fits with the at least potential reading of uh, many forms of rebellion, including those that we rightly abhor as having the self-image of, you know, we're fighting the empire. There's no question that some of America's worst enemies are Recruiting people through uh, a religious, uh, p- religious slash political uh, effort, including on social media, that that has some of the features of what we can see in, in these movies. I wonder how much that those features of the rebellion would have. I mean, one of the questions watching these things is why the rebellion is pretty small and why it seems to be as small as it is, given how overwhelmingly awful we're told the empire is. Um, and and so you get – I wonder how much of it is that from the perspective of someone in the existing system looking out at this, you've got a, a group of people who seem motivated by weird mysticism um, because even though they're not all Jedis, they use – they mention the force all the time and may the force be with you is kind of their standard thing um, and B, that they instituted this – terrorist attack against a space station that killed hundreds of thousands, mil- I don't know, I mean lots and lots and lots of Imperials um, and has that neat little like they've blown this thing up and so now two movies later we have to rebuild it or else they'll have won. Um, so I wonder how much those features played into the longevity of the Empire. It's a very good question. I mean my association is with uh, – Gordon Wood's book on the radicalism of the American American Revolution where he talks about how at a certain time in the United States, you know, people would doff their caps when they saw the rich people walking by and there was a system of of hierarchy with respect for authority that no one ever questioned. It was just part of their lives. And Wood's view was that the radicalism of the American Republic is that culture of deference was um, uh, assaulted and that made the American Revolution possible and kind of defined its uh, commitment to equal liberty, let's call it. Uh, And the reason I have that association is you could imagine people living under a, a terribly authoritarian regime which unless the foot is in your face all the time, in which case you say, get the foot out of my face, you think this is just what life is like. And uh, probably under the Iron Curtain, there were a number of people who thought this is what life was like. And the state would have to get very aggressive in intruding on people's admittedly dismal lives. Otherwise, <laughs> we get pretty aggressive by arresting people and they did plenty of that in order to foment a sense, you know, I'm going to put my life on the line or something. So, so when there's quiescence, it might be, as you were saying about Luke, a sense there's just nothing you can do or it might be terror. And the terror explanation is consistent with some of the scenes in Star Wars but I think the other is more interesting. 
Well, the the interesting thing, um, so the revolution or Luke's rebellion begins on Tatooine, which is a frontier planet. Now, frontier planets are always interesting to me. It's always a part of like a lot of star sci-fi in general. The frontier planet is where the the government ends, and as libertarian, I'm interested. That's what makes the frontier the frontier, and the, and they don't seem that interested in putting the boot. It seems like Luke maybe has never seen a stormtrooper before on Tatooine, and and they don't really keep law and order in Mos Eisley or anything like this. So it's a pretty free place. He hasn't really seen much of so so in that sense, uh, you can have outside of government, you can have these kind of rebellion things grow. But it, it does seem like an ideological revolution, as you like like the American Revolution was, as opposed to a I don't know what's happening in Venezuela right now. For just everyone is starving and oppressed and you just have to re rebel against the government to survive. But to get people on board with this rebellion, you need to preach the legitimacy or the illegitimacy of the governmental power in place and they remember the republic. So it's all, it's, it's all very interesting. I, it, I think it is more like the ideological revolution as you were saying. Um, so, so, the, uh, the other, so on the revolution though is a good time to get into since the, the one – the chapter in the book that uh, deals with what um, – I do here, constitutional law. You have a chapter on constitutional originalism and how it relates to Star Wars. Uh, and since, since we get the revolution and then the constitution comes out of the revolution and then you say why Star Wars is like – is helps argue why you shouldn't be an originalist. And our last guest was actually Randy Barnett. So you can like follow this right up with, uh, with uh, going against Randy's view of this. OK. So that's great. So I have a lot of admiration for Randy and uh, – I don't think anything in Star Wars should make him think, oh, I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, that'd be weird. But <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, it's an analogy, yes. Let, let's uh, sneak up at uh, on originalism. We'll uh, consider – treat originalism as the empire and we're going to do a sneak attack. And the, the sneak attack has the following form. Um, if you look at how our constitutional tradition actually works, this may be something to be sad about. And Randy is. But if you look at how it actually works, it's episode creation by the Supreme Court. So if the Supreme Court is dealing with, let's say, the question of sex equality in the 1970s, uh, there's – I think it's very hard to argue that the Equal Protection Clause – Forbid sex discrimination. That's that's really hard. I mean, irrational sex discrimination, maybe, but sex discrimination that has, let's say, an empirical justification, like saying uh, women spouses are more likely to dependent on their husbands than husband spouses than husbands are on their wives economically. That's at least in the seventies. That was fully rational assumption. The Supreme Court struck down the laws. I think what the court is doing in equal protection cases and it's doing in the free speech area too is it's saying you know, we have a, a background of episodes. You may say that the founding is episode one and it has a kind of pride of place. So maybe you can you know, fool around a little bit with Return of the Jedi but A New Hope, that's, that's <laughs> sacrosanct. But A New Hope is followed by The Empire Strikes Back which maybe doesn't have quite the, the, the status and maybe it's a decision like Marbury against Madison or something or McCulloch against Maryland where you can construe both Marbury and McCulloch and people do including Randy on McCulloch in particular in a way that is faithful to it. But in the case of the Necessary and Proper Clause, Randy would give uh, that clause a narrower reading that is now conventional. Uh, and he, he wants to write new episodes. Now, he, I think, wants to return uh, peace and justice to the galaxy. So he wants something that is uh, more intrusive on existing precedents than most participants, at least in the development of constitutional law. Uh, so what I guess I'd say to, to him and Justice Scalia, and Scalia is maybe a bit more with me than uh, appears, uh, uh, at least for much of his career he was, is that, that, that there are episodes being written which owe a duty of fidelity to those things that have come before but which involve a creative feature. You're, you're making best sense of them rather than uh, uh, – rather than um, – uh, following them. So 
uh, Brown against Board of Education, I think, is is an example of a, of a I'm your father moment. It also repudiated some precedents, uh, but it's it's trying to. Uh, make the unfolding constitutional narrative really awesome <laughs> rather than <laughs> bad. I think that's what Brown against Board of Education does. Now, on one view, some originalists say that they're doing exactly that. They're trying to maintain faith with our tradition writ large. And they like to say they can preserve a lot of the stuff that they can preserve more episodes than the non-originalists think. The fact that that's an ongoing debate, I think that's intriguing, where the non-originalists often say, I've said it myself, that a problem with originalism is that it forces jettisoning of so much of our tradition, and that's kind of a, a, a problem. Now, originalists have two possible responses to that. One is, well, we're jettisoning things that are illegitimate, so fine. The more interesting response in terms of what we're now talking about is uh, the original view, oh, we don't have to jettison Brown against Board of Education or freedom of speech. Those by our – we might have to rewrite the opinion a bit, but we by – We just have to retcon the Constitution. It's fine. <laughs> <That's> right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so all I want to say is that what George Lucas and now the, the Disney team is doing is uh, unfolding the narrative in ways that makes it both coherent and as good as it can be. And uh, that, that is, that's what constitutional law is like. Um, uh, originalists have to struggle a little bit more than non-originalists to acknowledge that. But many of them venture that struggle. So we're coming up to the end um, and I wanted to ask the – one of the popular questions among people discussing Star Wars in part because I think I disagree with you on this one. Um, you have a higher opinion of the prequels than I do. Um, so which of the, of the seven movies we've got now, what do you think the best say three are and then which one's the worst? OK. So the very best is The Empire Strikes Back. And uh, since I worked for President Obama, I've broken with him on nothing. Uh, uh, that that's not what a former government employee does is uh, certainly while the president is sitting, say, you know, you're wrong. But I'm going to break with him on this. He has said publicly A New Hope is the best of a Star Wars movie. The Star Wars movie. President Obama made a colossal blunder there. <laughs> That's impeachment right now. We're going to impeach him. It, it may not be a high crime or misdemeanor, <laughs> but, but The Empire Strikes Back is number one. A New Hope is number two. And Return of the Jedi is number three. Uh, those are two, two world historically great movies and one excellent movie. Uh, there is no worse Star Wars movies because they're also amazing and fantastic. There might be a least good Star Wars movie, and I'd say The Phantom Menace is the least good Star Wars movie. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.